Okay, so I think we can probably start. So um, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us in uh, our lecture uh, in the series on generative AI and drug discovery that is sponsored by uh, by Vant. Uh, I'm Michael Bronstein. I'm the DeepMind Professor of AI at the University of Oxford and uh, also Chief Scientist at uh, Vant AI. And today we have the great pleasure to have uh, Andrew Campbell um, uh, from the University of Oxford. So uh, he's a PhD student uh, that previously was at the other place, which is uh, the, the, the Oxbridge terminology for uh, referring to each other. And uh, Jason Im uh, from uh, MIT, he previously was at DeepMind and uh, did his undergraduate studies at uh, Johns Hopkins. And they will uh, present uh, their recent work on generative flows on discrete state spaces. So uh, thanks guys for uh, agreeing to give this talk. And without further ado, allow me to pass the stage to you. Thank you. Um, okay, yeah, um, thanks everyone. So um, the way it's gonna work is I'm gonna first like introduction, then Andrew will take over and then um, I'll come back for the last half of the talk. Um, so yeah, thanks Michael for the introduction. We're gonna talk today about our, our latest work on general flows for discrete state spaces and then how this has enabled um, multimodal uh, flows for application to protein co-design. Um, so uh, let's start beginning like um, at a high level picture of like what we're trying to model here. So in protein modeling, uh, this is kind of like a diagram of how current de novo protein design works, and it's worked well for many problems. Uh, previous works like um, our diffusion, chroma, frame diff, have all kind of followed this uh, um, pipeline for protein design. So kind of what you start off with is a function that uh, you want the protein to have, and then this goes through um, like a diffusion or a flow-based model to get structure, and the structure goes through inverse folding to get a sequence, and then the sequence goes to the wet lab for wet lab validation. And so I kind of drawn it out this way um, because it kind of highlights the limitations of current protein modeling paradigms where each step is formed independently, and then there's kind of no way to kind of do a uh, feedback loop. Or if you want to do a feedback loop, it's very tedious because you would have to um, try to backpropagate um, every the signal from the wet lab validation through each step. So while this has worked really well, there's um, some clear limitations that we want to move away from. So uh, next slide, Andrew. And so what we're, like, we're hinting at here is that uh, in, in protein design, kind of drawing inspiration from um, natural language and vision models is that to work towards like a foundation model, we need to be able to connect everything together so that everything is end to end, that signal can go between um, all the different modalities and that is multimodal, that we can work with function structure and sequence. And we want to also be able to fine tune everything um, together. So fine tuning compared to like found, um, like other domains is unique here because we have feedback coming in from the wet lab um, experiments, but also from like human experts or virtual screening methods like AlphaFold to um, that tells us like how good a protein uh, protein is that we, that we design. So this is kind of like the end goal, and instead of having um, like three different neural networks, three different models for each. Uh, for each modality, we kind of want a single model that can encapsulate everything. So um, I think uh, we think that this is going to be the future and what we should be working towards. So next slide. So our talk today is going to focus on just like one like uh, bi-directional error here, which is how do how do you go between um, structure and sequence? Um, this is what we're going to call multi-flow, and uh, we're going to discuss the technical contributions that we made to enable this sort of capability to go between the two seamlessly. Next slide. And so the technical contribution is um, we want to kind of fill this gap in generative protein modeling, where for the structure generation, there's been a ton of work in the, in the last um, two years of how to do structure generation um, well. And um, some, some options that I'm a little biased to liking is uh, like SE3 diffusion and flow uh, models that um, uh, were adopted in like RF diffusion, frame diff, fold flow uh, that uh, work work quite well for this space. So it's not like solved, but it works uh, pretty well for that, this application already. The other side of the coin that uh, we haven't had much success, success on is sequence generation of how to generate the sequence um, in tandem and together with the structure. And so the best option for this has been uh, really unclear uh, of how to um, do, do it uh, properly. So um, current approaches have not been super satisfactory, as in we know autoregressive models, they're the best performing in natural language, 
um, and also currently like ESM2 for protein sequences. But then how do we link this to the continuous flow modality of the structure? This part is not um, clear or obvious. There is the fusion models um, that you could try to link with flows and like SC3 diffusion, but um, they've always been done in like discrete time. So doing a continuous time, um, which Andrew Campbell has previously worked on is quite complicated to formulate. Um, and so if you just press next again, Andrew, um, our solution is to take kind of the inspiration of flow matching on like Euclidean spaces and apply them to discrete spaces where you have the same benefits in that it's a simpler and easier to implement version of diffusion um, that will also transfer to uh, sequences. So next slide. So the talk outline uh, is that Andrew is going to go through discrete flow models to discuss kind of the technical details of how to do flow matching on discrete state spaces. And then we have some um, uh, experiments on like just text data to uh, showcase and do some direct comparisons to other um, discrete generative modeling techniques. And then for the second half of the talk, I'll go over multi-flow of uh, how we've extended discrete flow models to do flows on continuous and discrete state spaces. Uh, that allows for some interesting combinations and um, explorations, and I'll discuss some like protein generation experiments uh, through that. So um, now I'm going to let Andrew take over. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Jason. So um, yeah, in this part of the talk, I'm going to go over the um, technical details of how we can formulate a flow model on discrete space. So the general idea of the flow model is um, pretty similar to the whole uh, denoising diffusion um, kind of methodology, where you're going to be constructing data through some kind of process that starts at noise that is easy to sample and then gradually uh, builds up the um, sample data point. So if we look uh, marginally at the like marginal distribution of this generative process from time zero, which is noise, and time one, which is data, then it will start out at some kind of easy to sample distribution and then gradually morph towards um, the data distribution. And if we can find a process that goes through those marginals, then we can achieve generative modeling. But the first question is, um, how do you actually go about defining this interpolating process? Um, like there's many ways you could spin it, but fundamentally, like what is a, a nice way to define this um, smoothly interpolating distributions? And the second question is, once we have those distributions that we want to go through in the generative process, how can we then construct like an actual stochastic process that um, actually goes through those marginals in time so that at generation, we can simulate that um, stochastic process and therefore uh, generate a, a new data point. So to go over the first question, how do we define this interpolating process? Well, this is where we um, are taking some uh, inspiration from continuous space flow matching where we define this um, marginal distribution at time t, un unconditional, the one that's flowing from noise to data, and we define it as an expectation of a conditional uh, marginal distribution conditioned on x1, which is um, a data point. And so if we um, dig a bit more into what this means, if we uh, define our conditional marginal distribution to be a mixture between just a, a uniform distribution over the state space uh, at time zero and at time one just being a one hot vector on x1. So I have the mathematical equation for that definition of a conditional uh, marginal distribution and it just starts at noise and then gradually uh, interpolates towards a one hot. And if we were to then take the mixture of that conditional process with respect to the data distribution, then we precisely get our desired set of marginal distributions that start at noise and then gradually morph towards the data distribution. And so this uh, conditional distribution in pink is uh, something that we are defining uh, as the uh, creator of the generative model. And another example is uh, like a masking type process where your conditional marginals in pink, they start at just a one hot on a mask variable, and then they gradually interpolate towards a one hot on the conditioned X1 variable. And then if you take the mixture of that to get an unconditional uh, marginal distributions, then they interpolate from one hot on the mask all the way to uh, the data distribution. And so like the reason we're always going towards one hot on the X1 is that when you take the uh, mixture of one hots with respect to the data distribution, you just get the data back out again. So that's why on the right-hand side, we're always recovering the data distribution. And we're just trying to define a, a smoothly interpolating process that goes from some easy to sample distribution and then smoothly goes towards the data. So once we have that 
uh, these marginal distributions, then how can we actually make a stochastic process that um, we can simulate to go through those marginals? Well, we can use a continuous time Markov chain to do that. And so a continuous time Markov chain is continuous in the time variable, but discrete in the actual state values that the uh, process is taking on. So at the start, you know, maybe we, uh, it can start in state one, and then for some amount of time, it stays there. And then out for a certain amount of time, say T1, it will then jump to a randomly chosen other state. And then it will sit in that state for a certain amount of time. And then at time two, it will uh, transition to another randomly chosen state and then sit in that for some amount of time and so on and so forth. Um, and these uh, wait times are continuous time random variables. And that's why the, the time axis is continuous, but the actual uh, state values like where it can jump to are discrete decisions. And to define a continuous time Markov chain, you need to make uh, use of a rate matrix. And this rate matrix like fully defines the dynamics of the of the CTMC, continuous time Markov chain. What the rate matrix is doing is it's telling you if I'm at state A, then at what rate am I making transitions to another state B? So rate being kind of like number of events per unit time. And if you are to just think about, okay, I'm gonna simulate the CTMC and I'm thinking about, I'm at state A right now uh, and I'm gonna simulate just a small time step DT, then um, the, the transition probabilities for your process, uh, if I wanna look at, okay, what's the probability that I'm gonna to transition to state B in the next time DT, that's just the rate matrix at AB multiplied by this uh, small time step DT. So the rate matrix both encodes, where am I gonna to jump to when I make a jump? And also at what speed am I making jumps? So like if the rate is high, then I'm actually gonna be jumping quite a lot. And if the rate is low, I'm not jumping very much at all. So now we have this uh, rate matrix that's defining this stochastic process. How can we use that to link to those marginal distributions that I was referring to earlier? Well, to do that, we can use the Kolmogorov equation, which uh, allows us to link these rate matrices to marginal distributions. And the Kolmogorov equation is just a, a continuity equation uh, in discrete space. So a continuity equation is looking at the difference in inflowing probability mass and outflowing probability mass. The inflow in orange, uh, if we're observing at state xt, the inflow probability mass is just uh, summing over the other states j, and you look at the rates coming into xt, and you weight that by those uh, the other the probability mass in that other state j, and that gives you the total inflowing mass. And the outgoing probability mass in blue is you look at state xt, and you look at all the rates going to other states j, and you weight that by the probability mass in state xt. And that gives you the total outgoing probability mass. And then the difference between the incoming and outgoing gives you the rate of accumulation of probability mass uh, in the current state xt. And this equation is allowing us to link, like I said before, the rate matrix to these changes in marginal distributions. So just uh, writing out the Kolmogorov equation before uh, with no differences to the previous slide. And then if we make a definition <clears throat> of the diagonal entries in our rate matrix as the negative row sum uh, of the off-diagonal entries in the rate matrix, then we can write the Kolmogorov equation in a very um, simple form as just the um, time derivative of this probability vector, where the probability vector is just the uh, probability that the uh, state is in each one of the different possibilities, and that gives us a vector. And the, the, the dt of that vector is just the rate matrix applied to dt. So this is um, an ODE in probability space, and this is where our flow is coming in, because probabilities uh, following this ODE like form a flow in this probability space. So now we have that, we're gonna um, put all these ingredients together to finally get the discrete flow model out. So repeating what I uh, had as the answer to question one, how are we defining these marginal distributions? We have it as this expectation of a conditional distribution with respect to the data. Now, what we are interested in is this green unconditional rate matrix the one that generates these uh, unconditional marginal distributions that we desire to go through. So we're trying to find this green rate matrix. And what we can use as a stepping stone is this pink X1 conditional rate matrix. And this rate matrix is the rate matrix that gives you the process that goes through the conditional marginal distributions. These are the one that are user defined. I'll talk more in detail about this pink rate matrix later, but for now, let's say we can get that. Um, so we have a rate matrix that 
gives us a process that goes through those conditional margin distributions, what we can do is uh, it turns out that the unconditional rate matrix is the expectation of this conditional rate matrix with respect to a denoising distribution. And the denoising distribution is um, given my current state xt, that is, has some amount of noise in it, um, predict the clean data x1. And that's my denoising distribution. And if I take the expectation of my conditional rate matrix with respect to that denoising distribution, then I get out an unconditional rate matrix. And with that, I can do generative modeling because I just simulate this green rate matrix. And that, and that actually goes through those marginals that I desired earlier, therefore doing um, generative modeling. So the missing ingredients <clears throat> in this recipe so far is this denoising distribution, which is intractable. It's like, it's not analytic. So we're going to have to learn that with a neural network as a, a denoising neural network to predict clean data given noisy data. And the second missing ingredient is this X1 conditional rate matrix. So I haven't said how we're going to get that, but later on, I'll show how this is actually analytic. And given some desired marginal distributions, you can just write down what this rate matrix is. Um, <clears throat> so with those two uh, in ingredients, uh, this is the overall discrete flow model algorithm. So to start with, you, you start at time zero and you take an initial sample of noise and you um, choose some uh, X1 conditional rate matrix. And we'll go over how to do that later. And then you just start your uh, sampling iterations. So the first step is to construct this um, green unconditional rate matrix. And that's um, the expectation of this X1 conditional rate matrix with respect to your learned denoising distribution. And that gives you your uh, rate matrix to simulate with. And then you just, uh, like we saw before, um, in the next time step DT, rate matrix times DT is the transition probabilities. So that gives you your update step in your next DT time step. You just multiply that unconditional rate matrix by a DT and you, you sample from that as, as a categorical variable. And that gives you your update. And then you iteratively do this process until you get to time one and you return a data point because simulating with the green rate matrix unconditionally is going through those marginals or the top right that we defined earlier. They start at noise and they gradually go towards data. <clears throat> so yeah, the first missing ingredient of the denoising model, uh, as I said before, we can learn this with a neural network. And to learn uh, to do denoising, we can just use the simple cross entropy loss. And the cross entropy loss is just you initially sample a data point and you sample some time it's uniform in zero to one and that gives you your corruption uh, amount and you apply the conditional marginal distribution the user defined distribution that gives you xt given x1 so that's just either um, say this like linear interpolation from uniform to a one hot or from a master one hot but they're quite simple they're just some amount of corruption so you corrupt with um, that time variable t and then you use your neural network to predict the corresponding clean data. So in the masking case, where your corruption is just setting uh, tokens to be masked, this looks a lot like just a, a language modeling loss where you're predicting um, masked positions. So this is a relatively simple loss to implement and will converge to um, the denoising distribution. And so the second missing ingredient was this conditional rate matrix. So I defined the green unconditional rate matrix as the expectation of this conditional rate matrix condition on x1. And this conditional rate matrix should satisfy the Kolmogorov equation for the conditional marginal distributions. And the conditional marginal distributions, we wrote those down at the start. That is how we are defining our generative model. So these are user provided. So say in this uniform case, um, this conditional marginal distribution is just <clears throat> linear interpolation between uniform and one hot. Take the time derivative of that. That's just um, literally just differentiation. And that gives you the left-hand side of the Kolmogorov. So we have a vector on the left-hand side, vector on the right-hand side, and we have this matrix that we're applying. And we're trying to find that matrix that satisfies um, this Kolmogorov equation. And that this Kolmogorov equation is underspecified. Like there are many rate matrices that all match the desired marginal distributions. So what we're going to do is we're going to find one solution to this equation, and then we're going to expand from that one solution, a whole family of rate matrices. And we can choose any one of these rate matrices we want to at test time, and they're going to influence our sampling dynamics. 
So the first solution that we give, so this is a solution that fits that Kolmogorov Grove equation, <clears throat> can be found just by inspection. And if you use this form, which involves um, the time derivatives of the conditional marginal distributions, as well as the marginal distribution itself, if you substitute that back into the Kolmogorov Grove equation, that satisfies it. So this is one solution that works. And then from this one solution, we can actually find a whole set of rate matrices that all satisfy the Kolmogorov equation. And, and what we do is we, we start with this kind of solution we found by inspection, and then we add on some amount of another rate matrix that is in detailed balance with the conditional margin distribution. And the amount that we're adding on of this second rate matrix, we're calling um, eta, which is like the stochasticity level. So um, I don't have time to go fully into the detail of why this is um, valid to do, but I have to take my word that RT of eta for any eta, they all satisfy the Golomakar of, so they all work. And we can choose any one of them as sample time and sample from that process. And so what we can do now is we can play tricks at sampling time to tune this stochasticity level to um, optimize the sample quality when we're sampling from our genetic model. So if we set the stochasticity level to zero, then what this looks like is a, is a, is a process that with very few transitions in it. So in this text example, <clears throat> when a token gets unmasked, it stays unmasked for the rest of the process. So we're just gradually unmasking things. And this looks a lot like a um, autoregressive model, but just in any order. And if we are to increase that stochasticity level, then tokens start switching back and forth. And we're increasing the number of transitions that are happening in our process. They all go through the same marginals, but they have different dynamics. And this switching back and forth process is allowing the model to make corrections as it is going through sampling. Um, so what can happen as the model is generating is if it's created a word that it then <clears throat> thinks is no longer valid in the rest of the generation, then this stochasticity allows it to make corrections to that word. So say if we look slightly on the right-hand side of this um, generating sentence, it starts to say um, hill, Hill here, but then will works a lot better in this uh, eventual sentence that it generates. So it allowed it to kind of like correct that mistake through this um, level of stochasticity. And this is something we can tune at sampling time to optimize sample quality. So we have some text experiments to um, <clears throat> uh, investigate this effect. And so uh, for this model, we generate uh, many paragraphs of text and then we're trying to um, <clears throat> we're trying to get the uh, sample quality of those paragraphs, and uh, we measure the sample quality using negative log likelihood of a larger language model. So the negative log likelihood is assigned by GPTJ, like a, a bigger language model. And if it gets low negative log likelihood, then GPTJ is thinking this uh, paragraph is um, like a meaningful piece of text. But if the negative, uh, if you repeat the same token over and over again, you can artificially gain <coughs> the negative log likelihood. So we also measure the entropy of the samples. So we don't want to be too far away from the data set entropy. So we don't want to be gaming the negative log likelihood too much. So the good portion of this graph is in the bottom right hand side with low negative log likelihood and high entropy. So, and we can see that when we increase eta, so eta zero is this dotted blue line. And when we increase eta, so we're allowing this um, back and forth token switching, we're pushing the line closer to that bottom right-hand side. So <clears throat> this, uh, <clears throat> sorry about it. This uh, sample quality uh, tuning is allowing us to actually improve the quality at test time. Okay, and with that, I'll hand back to Jason because uh, yeah, I think I, I'm uh, struggling to speak at this point. <laughs> um okay you want to share your screen yeah, i think you have to stop sharing okay, <clears throat> okay. um yeah hopefully everyone can can see this now so i'm going to now go into the multimodal um flow part of the talk and also be protein part so um so our ultimate goal is to do protein generation uh, and co-design. So to be able to generate both the structure and the sequence. And um, we call this technique multi-flow because there's going to be multiple flows happening on the structure space and the sequence space. 
uh, in total, there's three different flows. And the first one I'm showing here is how we're um, doing flows on the structure to generate structure from noise. So this is a figure from actually a previous paper um, where we already developed like SC3 flows. Uh, so here, the tra translations is the center of these frames that are moving in space. And in the rotations, RT is the rotations of the frames that are being deno uh, denoised from noise to the full protein structure. The, the sequence is what Andrew just um, described. Uh, here, this is the discrete flow model that we're just adapting to work in the sequence space for um, the protein sequence. Uh, so in this talk, uh, we're not going to be able to go into the SC3 flow matching part. That's a whole nother talk of itself. But um, these are two references. Uh, we had a, we uh, at the same time we had a paper um, doing SC3 flow matching, and then there's another paper by Mila, which Michael Bronstein is a um, co-author of. Uh, like this, ideas are very similar between the two. Um, and the nice thing about this lecture series is that I think one or two months ago they gave a talk on SC3 flow matching. So um, check out that talk to learn more about the um, structure part here. So when we um, let both of these flow together, like the structure and the sequence, then this is kind of what it looks like. You can see that the structure is gradually interpolating from noise to um, uh, the protein. And then the sequence is also gradually getting uh, unveiled over time. And there's this nice linear interpolation uh, corresponding to how much noise is still in the system. So here, both are being denoised at the same time. But then the natural question is like, what if we want to have different rates for the structure and the sequence? And the nice thing about multi-flow and doing multimodal general modeling is that you have um, exact control over how much noise is in each um, component. So to make this a little bit more uh, specific, um, we refer to this as, as decoupled time, as in we're going to let uh, t equal to how much noise or how much um, denoising is happening in the structure. And then T tilde is how much denoising is happening in the sequence. So by using like T and T prime, you can modulate how much of the structure and sequence is being or co-evolving throughout the flow. So we can play around with this to do flexible sampling, which will be our ultimate goal for a, uh, a bigger foundation model. Um, for code generation or code design, however you want to call it, we would start both the sequence and the structure at noise at time uh, zero. And then throughout the flow model, this would go to uh, one, where at time one, you would have the full sequence and structure um, uh, denoised and available. Inverse folding, which is a, another really important task in protein modeling, um, is, to, is a task of trying to generate the sequence uh, conditioned on a structure. And our framework allows for this because yeah, you can set t to 1 and provide the model the um, full structure and then just let the sequence get uh, masked starting from noise. So yeah, here t uh, is set to 1 throughout the time. So the, the ground truth structure is uh, made available. The other side of this is to do forward folding, which is kind of what AlphaFold does, where the, you, you fix the sequence um, and you just uh, let the structure get denoised uh, from 0 to 1. So we're able to have each three, all three of these tasks be a part of multi-flow. Uh, when you train a model, though, you have to train it so that the model sees um, every single combination of um, T and T tilt, uh, especially if you want to um, have them go at different rates. Uh, so we first uh, train it for a D couple times so that the model sees every combination of T and T tilt. And then in the actual loss, there's a structure loss of um, yeah, the, the, the SC3. So there's the rotation and the translation component. Um, and then there's the sequence loss here. And you take the, uh, the expectation over both these objects where you sample X, X, R, and A. So 80% of the time, we use this above loss so that the model sees every combination of T and T tilde. Um, and then 10% of the time we train via inverse folding because you have like a low probability to sample um, T equals one um, all the time. So in this scenario, we're setting T fixed to one and then you're just sampling um, T tilde, which is how much noise is in the sequence. And in 10% of other 10% of the time, we train with forward folding where you fix the, um, the sequence and you sample different amounts of noise in the structure. And we, we didn't play much around with these percentages. Um, it's something that I think future work will look into of what's the, like, the optimal combination of training on each of these tasks. <clears throat> um, so for the experiments, um, 
we train on PDB, which um, is the same data set that was in a uh, frame diff, um, a, a previous paper, uh, where it's about 20,000 20, proteins that are length 60 to 384, and these are monomers, and we also filter them so that um, they only have less than 50% loops. And for evaluation, the main thing that we're going to be looking at is, uh, is actually say cogeneration. Um, but the secondary results that we're going to look at um, is forward folding and inverse folding. So I, I separated these out because we our main goal was to get generation to be really good and forward and inverse folding was an auxiliary thing to um, evaluate but not necessarily push in this paper. Um, so for generation, we follow RF diffusion's way of evaluation. They sample 100 backbones of uh, length 70, 100, 200, 300, and then report the percentage that pass designability, which is the main metric that we care about. And then you also need these auxiliary metrics like diversity and novelty to um, uh, yeah, see that you're not being degenerate and sampling the same structure every time. Uh, and inverse folding, uh, this one, like we use the same model. So a single model is trained. And then we uh, just take a subset of proteins after this date, after clustering, to investigate like how inverse folding um, designability is. And then forward folding is the same test set as inverse folding, but we measure the RMST between the uh, the generated structure and the ground true structure for a given sequence. Um, so designability, if people aren't familiar with this metric, um, is like uh, simple to explain. Uh, you first start off with noise, and a multi-flow will uh, generate the backbone. And then you have this option of how you do sequence design. The sequence can um, come out of multi-flow, but it can also come out of another method uh, that, that does inverse folding only. So once you have the sequence and the backbone, uh, you can use then ESM fold to or ABA fold to re-predict the structure from the sequence and then compare this predicted sequence with the generated backbone um, from noise. And then if the we call it a success if the RMS due is less than 0.2 nanometers. Um, this is this is after alignment. And then we're going to report the percentage of samples uh, that that pass this criteria. And then we're going to call this uh, the RMSD between the backbone and structure as the subconsistent RMSD. Uh, yeah, we'll calculate it. And this RMSD is in uh, nanometers. Um, OK, so now we're going to kind of evaluate the different ways of designing the sequence and the structure. We have three different um, scenarios that we evaluate. The first is called co-design one, where you use our model multiflow to sample one sequence um, and structure. Um, and the other the other way that's uh, most popular is to use protein pen end to uh, generate the sequence in a two stage process. So we use multiflow to generate both the structure and the sequence, but the sequence is actually thrown out in this case. And protein pen end is used to generate a sequence uh, conditioned on the structure out of multiflow. And the point of this is to see how the sequence from protein pen end will compare to the one that we um, actually learned through through co design. The third one that's actually the um, the most common way that people uh, use uh, the general models in practice is to have protein pin and generate eight sequences. So you start protein pin with different um, seeds and you have it generate uh, eight hopefully diverse sequences and you can test every one of them uh, and see how many of them are designable with the structure that comes out of multi-flow. So we're going to um, test out uh, all three of these um, metrics or all three of these versions of how to get the, the sequence. So when we first um, looked at this problem, uh, we, we noticed that there was kind of like a big gap between protein pin and multiflow. Like we we debugged everything and we kind of confidently said like, okay, if we train on this uh, sequence data set, then our performance using uh, multiflow for a sequence is worse than if you use protein design. And it, you can see that it's almost a 2x difference. So um, this was kind of surprising and uh, not very good at first. Um, and so investigating more into this, uh, we found that actually the training sequence distribution is not very good. As in, um, if you try to calculate the metric on the actual training data itself, you get pretty poor uh, performance um, at, in the sense that only 70% of the training data, like the sequences that are in PDB, would pass this designability um, metric. Now, there's a question of like, OK, does that mean the metric is bad or um, like, uh, yeah, the, the, the data set is bad. And I, I think that's a <clears throat> question that future works will have to look at. Like, we definitely need more metrics to um, really have like a whole view, holistic view of the problem. But <clears throat> for our scenario here, um, we noticed that the training data is not really good for the metric that we're going after. So the issue is that, again, just to reiterate, is that the training data is not good for the metric that we're, we're going for. 
<laughs> and in fact, like if you read the original protein pin and, um, paper, they found that like um, they get much better designability um, compared to like the uh, PDB data set itself. Um, yeah, so like then we started to kind of like fix this issue by fixing the training set. Um, so it's worth noting that like protein pin is like highly regularized to um, avoid overfitting. That uh, protein pin actually doesn't learn, uh, doesn't really have like very low perplexity on the training set. Um, there were steps taken to make it worse than regularize it to avoid overfitting. And so what we did is like we actually took all the protein uh, or all the sequences, we ran into protein pin in. We found that the metric of the protein pin sequences are much lower than the actual training data that we were originally training with. So there's this big shift to the bottom right here, um, which shows that the protein and PNN sequences that come out are um, much better for the metric than the uh, wild type that you get out of PDB. So what we sought to do is something called redesign, where we train on the protein and PNN sequences rather than the wild type. Um, so you can see that there might actually be some like wild type sequences that are better than protein. So we just keep like the, 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 the better of the two. Well, actually, I guess in this case, all the protein sequences are better. Um, and so then after we do this redesign of using protein to basically relabel our data set, um, we find that now most of our data set is designable and better to train on theoretically. Um, so this so like an ML person, and I'm more of an ML person, this kind of raises some red flags because you're actually just training on protein banded sequences, which could have like an adversarial um, effect on your downstream task. Mm -hmm. um, and so kind of one interpretation of what you're doing when you're training on protein banded sequences is that you're actually training on more stable sequences. Um, we know that like the, the, the natural sequences that are in PDB and in nature are not always known to be stable. They are functional, but, but not stable. Um, yeah, protein mini sequences, uh, people have done a lot of works to uh, find out that they're actually way more stable than the wild type sequences. And stability has this um, nice property that like uh, for protein design, general protein design, it allows you like more room for mutations without like unfolding the protein and it completely losing its function. So um, there's this uh, uh, well-cited paper by Francis Arnold's group that shows that protein stability is um, very desirable for like directed evolution in this case, but also for de novo protein design. So it is like a good thing, but there's also this bad thing in that some proteins um, rely on this instability to be able to perform its function. So like enzymes are highly dynamic, condensates have a lot of intrinsically disordered regions. Um, so uh, depending on your protein or sorry, depending on your design task, you might not want stability. And so there, this also brings into question like, we should not just be um, considering designability as the only metric. Um, so that's just like a caveat to this whole thing. Um, in this paper, we only look at designability as the metric, uh, but there needs to be more better metric and more better virtual screening methods. Um, the second thing that we thought was that, um, okay, there's been a lot of like ideas around distillation recently in um, like adjacent areas and NLP and computer vision. So can we also train on synthetic data from a generative model? So to investigate this, we took a one of our very uh, initial multi-flow models, we trained it, and then we sampled about 20,000 backbones, uh, which is like uniformly sampled lengths there. And then out of those, we took the structure that were passing designability with uh, protein pin and eight, and then these were clustered to get around um, 4.2 thousand um, unique synthetic proteins, and we use this to augment the, the, the training data set. Um, so this is a... Uh, very similar technique of how people do data distillation and other scenarios with um, general models. And so when we when we did this, we found that um, after training on the protein pin and sequences and the distillation ones, we get almost on par performance with protein pin one. Um, so now the difference is that uh, we're on par with protein pin N, but we only need one model for sequence and structure generation. And so this will help us towards our um, ultimate goal of like actually having a foundation model that can do everything together. Um, so like performance actually didn't increase that much, but uh, by distilling it, you had to just have like one step or like one flow that you have to run to generate everything. Um, and then we we took this and looked at like other um, protein general models. So uh, one that, that we looked at was compared to protein generator. Um, they also kind of do protein sequence and structure co-design. Uh, co and we found that uh, after these steps, we were able to get a lot better results than, than them. And then the other, uh, the state-of-the-art method, RF diffusion, um, they actually compare on protein pin and eight of um, 
yeah, using eight teams of protein pinin. And we find that um, after these tricks, we're also able to get better protein pinin eight performance as well, and also protein and pinin one. And in diversity and novelty are very similar to each other. Um, and so I, I mentioned that uh, we also evaluated forward and inverse folding because we're also able to um, do this task with, with a single model. Um, so looking at these, we find that the inverse folding result is pretty close to protein pinin, as in uh, the inverse folding RMSD is like two for protein pinin and 2.2 for multi-flow. Um, but then for the forward folding results, we find that our model is way worse than like ESM fold, which um, it's just, it just a lot faster to run. Uh, so we compared to ESM fold. And so this leaves a lot of room for improvement for forward folding um, <clears throat> that uh, we're, we're planning to explore in future works. Um, so everything that we've discussed so far is to do unconditional generation. So there's like no conditioning that you want to do. Um, uh, we also have like another paper that explored multi-scaffolding with SE3 flow matching. Uh, in, in this particular paper, we didn't explore uh, sequences or, or co-generation with the sequence, but this is something that we're also uh, looking into uh, doing multi-scaffolding uh, with, um, with multi-flow as well. But um, this is also a paper that's uh, on archive that you can look at um, and, and see. So um, like this is uh, near the end of my talk, a little faster than I thought, um, but multiflow is a paradigm that allows for generating disc both discrete and continuous data. And so for proteins, this kind of allows a general purpose model across every task. So uh, we didn't exactly um, uh, evaluate some of these arrows, like just pure structure, gen well, I guess just pure sequence generation, but it's, it's theoretically possible to do all of these. And so the paper was uh, kind of like a proof of concept and more of developing the framework around it. But I think, or we think there's a lot of room to improve and have a uh, model that can do all these tasks together at like a state-of-the-art um, uh, performance. And uh, it would be remiss to like not mention that this is a extremely active field of how to do multimodal protein modeling. Um, there's like papers doing it on just peptides or antibodies. Um, and, and and also trying to do like all item generation as well. Uh, so it's, it's a very active area of research and all of these methods have different flavors to them that I think um, we all need to explore the different uh, techniques and um, evaluate, them and evaluate them and share the results from each other. And there, there's more beyond this that I just didn't have time to, or didn't, didn't have space to put on a single slide. And similarly, there's a lot of recent work on discrete journal modeling. Um, the discrete flow model is just one approach that you can take. There's discrete dis discrete diffusion models that um, are coming out, but there's also like uh, doing flow matching or dis uh, diffusion on the simplex. Uh, that's also from my group, uh, Dershay flow matching. Um, and then also, also like discrete guided diffusion uh, that have been working really well for antibody generation by people at Prussian design. So um, again, there's like a lot to explore in this space. So kind of the future work, um, just to close off, is like we want to ultimately close the loop. Multiflow is one way to do both structure and sequence generation. Um, but how do we actually combine this with function? Like how do you uh, incorporate function in there? That's um, very un unclear to us currently. And then how do you incorporate the experimental feedback? So this is like one piece of the puzzle. And uh, I think we both hope that everyone can contribute and help out. Um, yeah, so just to close, like these are some acknowledgments uh, to our advisors, Tom, Regina, and Tommy. Um, yeah, so I think that's that's it. Definitely ended earlier than I thought. <laughs> cool, awesome. Thanks, Jason and Andrew, for the great talk. Very interesting. It was cool to see, especially after previous talks with uh, Joey and Alex from Repold on stochastic flow matching and also Gavrik and Zach from Generate on Chroma. Um, while uh, we'll go through the Q&A, uh, just for everyone, please submit your questions, should you have any, into the Q&A section. And then uh, I'm going to hand them to Jason and Andrew. Um, and then I think we can get started with the first one from Thomas. Um, he's asking, what are the pros of multimodal-based versus latent-based foundation models? Yeah. Uh... I think, I think this is a uh, active area of research of what's the um, pros and cons of both. I, I, I can see both being very strong, um, but maybe both have different applications as well. Like in multimodal flow matching, or sorry, multimodal general modeling, you actually are dealing with the um, the modalities you care about, I guess. Like in, in, in latent-based modeling, the latents are not always decipherable and not always interpretable, but in the structure and sequence regime, you're actually reasoning in the spaces that you care about. So you can do 
um, maybe like better explicit conditioning on those modalities rather, whereas maybe you can't do in the latent space. Um, but regardless, I think like people have just started exploring uh, latent um, general modeling. So it's a uh, active area of research that we have still have yet to explore. Cool. Then the next question was, uh, could this be extended to atomistic representations? So SE3 on atoms and then smile selfies for the discrete space? Yeah, um, I, I think there have been a lot of interesting works like uh, Rosetta Fold All Atom and obviously Alpha Fold Latest that are working in the all atom space. Um, it's, it's just another question like, how do you uh, rep represent like frame sequences and the atoms of like small molecules and stuff? Um, that could be just adding on like another modality of like origin angles uh, and uh, frames to these small molecules, kind of like in the Rosetta Fold All Atom scenario. Um, but it's also like another uh, active area research that um, I think our, our framework can definitely extend to, but how to do it in the optimal way um, that I'm not sure about. Amazing. Maybe I have um, a question. Did you see um, any particular structures that are harder to generate than others? So uh, maybe particular types of uh, proteins, maybe antibodies or... Um... Yeah, I, I, I think... Um, so... There's like a few layers to this question. Uh, like one thing we know is that these models tend to go after like local minimas uh, quite often. Like alpha, like uh, alpha helices are very easy to generate out of these models. And we saw the same thing with multi-flow. The alpha helices are the predominant structure that are generated. Like beta sheets are really difficult to generate. And um, as like a result, antibodies would also be kind of really difficult to generate. Um, and we only kind of trained on like kind of this like small uh, set. So um, we, we, we didn't definitely, there's just definitely a lot more data to train on and explore uh, different protein families of how well they do there. Um, the, the other thing is that I think, I think the metrics that we use, designability in particular, is very biased towards stable, robust proteins. So the model does generate things that are flexible. We do see some like conformational ensembles happening in some of the structures that we generate, but the metric that we use just doesn't really like them. Like designability is not a good metric for those flexible proteins. Um, so like in, in the paper itself, we weren't able to maybe showcase like some of the cool things that were happening with like flexibility and stuff like that. Um, so, uh, that, that's something that the metrics are not favorable towards, but, uh, I think, I think we should have good metrics to explore those different proteins. Awesome. Then. There's actually two more questions coming in. One was, what would functional prediction look like in a multi-flow framework? Could you add a flow that predicts binding site residues or have gene ontology labels generated, either with sequence or a structure? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that's 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 like a really interesting question. Um, maybe Andrew can point to this too, but um, I think our framework gives you an option to model things in a continuous framework or a discrete framework. So it's like, is your function that you care about maybe like a discrete thing or a continuous thing? Um, if it's like uh, like a binding site, then that's maybe like more of a discrete thing. So you can maybe model in like a discrete way, um, but also maybe you don't even need like general modeling for these functions. And I, I think with proteins in particular, there's a lot of functions that have uh, different flavors to them. So uh, seeing how you can um, incorporate that in is an interesting question. Like, like maybe it's just like some sort of energy function that you want to minimize both the structure and the sequence. Yeah, yeah, I guess I can just add like <clears throat> with, with this kind of like multimodal framework, no matter kind of what kind of <clears throat> conditioning or um, label you might be interested in, even if it's kind of like both continuous and discrete, like, you know, some positions maybe, and maybe, you know, some labels somewhere, then when you when your uh, model is modeling kind of everything jointly, then it's, you know, whatever information you have, you can put that in, no matter kind of like what kind of complex mixed data it is and then <clears throat> the the model has like learned to reason over all those different combinations awesome then next question was uh you've successfully incorporated synthetic data from protein mpnn did you also explore using synthetic data uh, the other way around alpha fold yeah, so we, we did some early exploration of this. Like we tried to use the Swiss prod data from Alphafold 2. This is the distillation set. Um and I, I think the reason that uh so we, we tried that and we actually got 
worse results, like the synthetic different alpha fold two didn't help. It might've been the like capacity thing that our model wasn't big enough. Um, but also we noticed that like the alpha fold dislocation has a lot of loops in them. So this is actually a reference to my answer to Michael's question earlier that um, when you have like very loopy proteins that don't have a lot of secondary structure, um, the model typically tends to do a lot worse on the designability metric. Um, so that was just like our initial finding with the synthetic depth from alpha fold two, um, cause there's only, there's, there's not that many proteins that alpha fold is very highly confident about. Um, alpha fold, the thing, thing it's not confident about it has a lot of loops in them. Uh, so it's like a, it's a, it's an interesting question of like, how can you incorporate a synthetic data from alpha fold two in a way that, um, helps the model and the metrics that you care about. Cool. And then last question, um, can you explain again why you fixed the data? Was there any bias during the process? Yeah, so the metric that we use is designability. Um, this metric is how good is alpha fold to, uh, or like ASM fold in our case, like the sequences, or how good can I predict the original structure from the sequence? Um, and the truth is, is like the natural sequences that occur in nature, um, like ASM fold, uh, like, can can predict a uh, lot in like two accuracy that we have for uh, designability. Um, so we had to use protein pin n to refold all the sequences to get uh, a better training set to uh, train on. So there's definitely a bias towards more stable sequences that I explained earlier uh, in my slides. And I explained that this could either be bad or good depending on what your final application is. If you care about enzymes a lot, then designability is not what you want in the end because uh, enzymes are very flexible. Um, so it's like uh, the, the metric creates this target that we're trying to optimize. And so we made the data set better suited for that metric. Yeah. Thanks, guys. I think probably there are no more questions. Uh, thanks for a great talk. And as usual, there will be a recording um, on YouTube. So those who couldn't join uh, online would be able to, to watch it afterwards. OK, yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation. Bye. Thanks, everyone, for joining.